On this episode of Unmute the Voices, I speak with Vivian Phillips, an amazing and inspiring arts advocate and consultant. We talk about her life journey and where she learned her resistance to adversity. And she gives some really encouraging words for those of you who might feel like your voices have been muted. That's right now here on Unmute the Voices. Vivian, welcome to Unmute the Voices. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I would have never considered that I would show up on <laughs> Unmute the Voices. <laughs> My voice is, needs to be muted for it the most part. Be... <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm great. Good. I'm really good. Thank you. You're kind of back in your roots being here in, in a... radio. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. How's it feel? I love being in this environment. Mm -hmm. I really do. And, uh, you know, with a podcast, I guess I keep going back and forth into radio in some kind of way. So mm -hmm. I'm comfortable here. It's the cameras <laughs> <laughs> that I, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. Been there too, but. Right, right. My first love is radio. Yeah. So, I mean, having double exposure, I mean, this has been a really fantastic podcast that you share with Marcy Silman. Yeah. What sort of things have you learned in the last year having this podcast? I think the thing that I've learned about, mostly about the podcast, is that um, it's, it's never too late to have an ability to have an opinion mm. and to also shine the light on other people in the arts. Mm -hmm. That's really been a biggest learning for me because when, when Marcy suggested we do a podcast, I was like, well, doesn't everybody in the world have a podcast? Mm. I mean, what's going to make ours different? But we happened to have started at a time when there absolutely was kind of like zero arts coverage in the city of Seattle, both print and on radio. And Marcy had just left 35 years mm -hmm. of working at KUOW. And I was honored. I was like, you think we can make this work? Cool, let's do it. So mm -hmm. I've learned it's never too late to do what you want to do or what you know might just be in your heart mm -hmm. and you didn't know you wanted to do it. And so using double exposure, how have you been able to unmute the voices of people in Seattle who are in arts uh, organizations? Oh my, you know, from the very first episode that we did with Alesheva Johnson and her father, Charles Johnson. Oh, I remember that. I mean, like that was epic because I've been a Charles Johnson fan, and Alesha mm -hmm. knows this about me, um, for years, many, many years. And to have the opportunity to talk with him and have him be in conversation with his daughter, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, having the opportunity to chat with Virginia Johnson, mm -hmm. who I think she's still the artistic director at Dance Theater of Harlem, although she was transitioning out of that position and making room for Robert Garland. So it's it's been joyous to have those conversations with people that I love mm. and maybe know from a distance and others I know more, you know, closely, but it's just been incredible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I've enjoyed it. So how does one get to be on the podcast? Well, <laughs> we don't have an audition process or anything. <laughs> it's kind of me and Marcy going, who we want to talk to today? Mm -hmm. um, you know, last season, we focused on four neighborhoods in the city of Seattle mm -hmm. and looked at the ways in which arts and culture helps to build community. So we did work at Seattle Center, the Seattle Waterfront, South Park, and the Central District. So it was really kind of uh, about 
what are the major arts and cultural institutions, if you will, in those different communities. Mm -hmm. And learning about South Park was incredible. Mm -hmm. Learning about the arts and education programs down there, about a new dance program that's, um, uh, that was started by a former, the former director of education at Spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, and and hearing about how they interact with community, mm -hmm. doing a live broadcast from Seattle Waterfront, and talking to another one of my favorite people in the world, Leonard Garfield, mm -hmm. who I could talk to forever. He has so much rich history just in that body of his, not to mention Mohai and how that holds history. Um, and then in the Central District, we got to do a live recording at Wanawari. Mm. And so, you know, these are places that I love. I love this city, and mm. I think you know that. Yeah. And I think that part of what I love doing is uncovering the beautiful parts about this city mm -hmm. while also talking about some of the challenges that the city has mm -hmm. so that we can inform policy mm -hmm. in a way that makes this place fulfilling for every single resident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how you get on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> double exposure. Well, speaking of that, I mean, you're from Seattle yeah. and because of just who you are and the impact that you have had on the city, arts and culture, and the black community, and, and youth, I should say, mm. there are so many other cities that would just snatch you up. And I'm sure over the years you have gotten offers to mm. go to other cities. Why have you stayed here in Seattle? And second to that, what has made you such a loyal resident of the city. Yeah, well, let me start with the second part first. Um, and I tell this story all the time. You know, my parents migrated to Seattle in the 50s. Uh, my father came out first and then um, brought my mother and my brother here. And then three of his six sisters moved here. So that this was my, this is what I knew. You know, even though I had the opportunity to spend a, a reasonable amount of time in the South and Arkansas with my extended family there. What I watched my parents do, they were, you know, maybe below middle class, not really middle class. Mm -hmm. My father was a laborer and my mother was a laborer as well. But I saw how dedicated they were, particularly my mother, mm. to this city, to her community, to her neighborhood. Mm. She was one of the founders of the Judkins Rejected Community Council, mm. which was an early community council, but the focus was to not, this was during the time when I-90 was uh, being upgraded, and they were actually going to bypass an exit into the central area. And my mother and her friend Dorothy, uh, I mean Dolores Bradley, they were active in the community and they rose up and said, you can't do this. You have to provide an exit and an entry to this major thoroughfare to the east side in the central area. You mm. can't just bypass us because they knew what would happen. Mm. They knew that we would be cut off essentially, you know, from major modes of transportation. And um, she was just always active. She was always involved in something to better the community. And it was usually focused right in the Central District, mm. right? Her work was right there. Um, you know, later in life, she became a real estate agent. And so she sold property to a number of black families. And I watched that, and I understood the significance of ownership in your own community. My mother owned, you know, she lived in the same house for 52 years. Wow. Um, and so that's kind of where my loyalties, I think, began. But also having the opportunity as a teenager to start working in radio that was black radio, that was focused on the black community. Again, I learned so much about my community. And there were so many things that I thought, 
people need to know, right? Mm -hmm. And if I can be a carrier of this knowledge, of the legacies of all the people that I had the good fortune to be around, um, I'm going to do that. Mm. I'm absolutely going to do that. I have on a number of occasions thought about moving to other places. And I'm going to tell you what gets me. Mm. Where are the mountains? (laughs) (laughs) Where are the snow-capped mountains? And where are the bodies of water, right? Yeah. And there's no place like this place. (laughs) You know, there are certain areas like 18th and Union. I remember as a child, you know, asking my father, can we go down that street so that I could see those beautiful Mm. mountains, the Cascade Mountain Range, and then look behind me and see the Olympic Mountain Range. So you got... It's just, it's really about that. And the greenery. I mean. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. Where Nothing else? beats it. There's just no place. Mm. <laughs> and I've tried. Believe mm-hmm. me, I've looked at other places and gone, uh, mm-hmm. maybe, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. quality of life is really important to me. And that's what Seattle provides me is a, a really high quality of life. Hmm. Yeah. And so this legacy that your mother basically passed on to yeah. you, you have now passed it on to your daughter, Jasmine yeah, Scott, yeah. who is the executive director of Art Noir. Yeah. So would you say that this, this uh, that you have kind of instilled in your kids what your mother instilled in you of investing in the community, of giving back. Can you talk a little bit about how that's executed through Art Noir? Yeah, you know, fortunately, all of my children got to interact with my mother. They did not know my father. My oldest, who is my son, um, my father died when he was uh, 10, 9 or 10 years old. Um, And he's the only one that really knew my dad. Um, but because they knew her, they knew, you know, about community engagement and community activism and involvement, all of that. Um, I don't think my parents or my mom or my brother, who was also really very dedicated to Mm -hmm. the community, really understood what it was I did because, you know, I went into broadcast and they were like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I don't think they really truly understood. And now I think they would be able to see what all of my early um, development resulted in. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not here, um, mm-hmm. unfortunately. But I think um, Jasmine would tell you that of the three children, she is the one that actually had the greatest love for community and for the arts, Mm -hmm. and for black arts specifically. And I drug my kids around to everything, so, you know, it's not like I chose one of them. All three of them um, were very engaged with me, but it just so happens that Jasmine is the one who desired this Mm -hmm. as a profession. And... um, she gets it, mm-hmm. you know. She's worked in community for over 20 years, and she's worked with kids. Mm-hmm. And she understands the necessity of nurturing young people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and also creating environments where they can feel safe and they can see a vision of their future selves. Mm. So I think that's what we both are really inclined toward, and that's how it really shook out. Where did your love and passion for the arts come from? Mm. You're not a practicing artist yourself. I'm not yet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, is there something we need to know? Let me set this scene. <laughs> I am so trying to figure out exactly what my practice is. I think I know what it is. But... Where's that come from? Oh, man. Um... So, I was a bad kid, okay? <laughs> you was bad? <laughs> like, I talking in smart. class, yeah, yeah, bad. yeah, yeah, that kind of bad. <laughs> I was smart, you know, but I like to challenge my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and, and even before that, let me back up and say that, you know, I come from a family where, you know, the kids would be encouraged to dance at the family gatherings and mm. perform, you know, that kind of, right. you know how yeah. black families yeah. do, oh, like, yeah. come at on, babies, <laughs> come on in here, babies, now do that dance, you know. <laughs> So that's really where it started. Okay. And then in grade school, I always would put together some group that would lip sync or dance or something mm-hmm. for the talent shows. <laughs> and then in middle school, you know, because most of us went to, you know, elementary school, then we went to middle school, and there was always talent show. Right. I kept doing it, right? So there was always a group mm-hmm. of some sort. <laughs> I always had a group. <laughs> and then I started singing. So I started singing with a couple of bands around locally. Wow. Um, yeah. You sang? Mm, I did. Sang. <laughs> used to (laughs) that's in the past tense um but going back to you know where i think i really developed my love for the arts and that was because i uh was asked to move from garfield high school into the nova program (laughs) what yeah yeah and that was before I graduated high school. So tell everyone what the NOVA program is. I don't know what NOVA stands for today. I really don't. But it was like the alternative school for bad kids. (laughs) Like Sharpless back in the 90s. You know? But there were classes at Horace Mann Uh across the street from Garfield. And it was kind of like, you can go over there and you go over there and do something else, okay? Because Uh you're disruptive over here. Mm. But what it did is it put me into art classes. It put me into art classes. And I learned how to make jewelry. And one of my art teachers was Dion Henderson. And Dion Henderson was a Black Panther. And he is the one that painted the Black Panther wall on 20th Avenue and Spruce. So then that got me into kind of the bigger arts community and environment. Wow. Yeah. So Black Arts West was around at the time. Yeah. I was ne- I never acted, you know, with them. I might have put together a group. <laughs> 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 we might have danced or something there. Um, but I really got exposed to black art huh. in that way. Starting with the black starting with Nova, then the Black Panthers. Black Arts West, and then came broadcast for me. Mm. And um, Eddie Rye and Veltry Johnson Mm. and um, all of those guys used to do a television program once a month uh, at Como. And it was a part of um, Oscar Productions. And Oscar Productions was Nate Long. And Nate Long went on to be an actor and a filmmaker. He started the, um, uh, broad, I, I guess it's the television media program at Seattle Central, something like that. And I just got hooked. Wow. You know, I used to be able, I was an associate producer on the program. They taught me how to do all of that in television. Um, I got my radio operator's license and I was wow. an engineer, wow. you know. So, <laughs> so the yeah. arts kind of saved you. Or at least <laughs> kept you out of trouble. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It, 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 it really did expand my concept. Mm. of who I was. Mm. That's what the arts did for me. Mm -hmm. And it gave me this um, real confidence that I could do more than I ever thought I was able to do. And a lot of that had to do with being around people who pushed and encouraged me, Mm, mm. you know? And all of my early work, you know, another thing I used to do, I used to be a seamstress. And so there was a, a really cool boutique in uh, right on 22nd and Madison. Wow. It was called Needles and Threads. And we used to make clothes for the Seattle Supersonics because wow. they were so big and tall. And so, wow. yeah, so my, my life has been centered pretty much in Seattle's black community. 
Wow. And of course, I've had, you know, a lot of Mm -hmm. external experiences, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. that's where I lived and breathed. Wow. Yeah. And, and and what an amazing story. I mean, because it's created this legacy for you here <laughs> in this city that has just been truly heartwarming to thousands and thousands of people mm. here in this in, in Seattle. When you look back on your life and you just kind of walked us through your journey of, you know, kind of getting in, in trouble, going to an <laughs> alternative school, discovering the arts. What's your response to students who might have a similar path that you might have had when you were their age, who might be in trouble or may feel like they're misunderstood? What sort of of advice can you give to someone who's watching this who may be a parent or a guardian or a mentor who just doesn't know how to get through Mm -hmm. to that young person? Mm -hmm. What would you say Mm -hmm. to them? You know, I think um, what worked for me, continues to work for me, uh, is not embracing other people's concept of what I can do. Hmm. Um, And while I talked a lot about my mother and how I watched her, um, the path that I took was not the one she wanted me to take. She wanted me to take a real traditional path, right? Which you was? need to go learn how to type. <laughs> mm. You know, you need to go, you know, be a flight attendant with stewardess at that time. Um, you know, something that felt stable mm-hmm. to them, to that generation. Mm-hmm. And what I'm talking about is a generation that came through segregation, Jim Crow, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it was about how do you secure your future in a traditional way? Mm. And I have never been traditional. Mm. And um, I think what I would encourage people to do is to really find ways to get their own confidence stimulated as well as don't let, let go of your dreams. What, what is your big vision for yourself? Mm-hmm. And, if, and if you fail, at least you tried. Mm. At least you tried. You can't just say, oh, I'm not suited for that. You know, one of uh, my early interns who was at um, Garfield High School, and I think I was working at that time at Big Sisters, mm-hmm. um, she came to me and said that she had this big dream for herself. She wanted to go to college. She wanted to earn her master's degree, you know? And she was at Garfield, and one of the counselors told her, you should not have such big dreams for yourself. Mm -hmm. We've heard that before. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, okay, well, what's her name? (laughs) 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 Let me call her up, right? I know that's right. (laughs) And get that right. Um, You know, Jasmine had a similar experience at Garfield, um, Mm. being told that coming from, she went to Lakeside, and she left Lakeside and wanted to graduate from Garfield. And she had her dreams dampened by a teacher. Mm. And I think advocacy is the thing that Mm -hmm. I do really well. Mm -hmm. I will go to a class. (laughs) I will roll up on a teacher, yeah, okay? Yeah. I will roll up on a boss yeah. and be like, I'm, I'm confused right. about what it is you say you want to mm-hmm. do versus what it is you're doing. Mm-hmm. So I think advocacy is that thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's that in-between mm-hmm. But where does that come from? Because there's a certain amount of courage, yeah. grit, humility, and respect that one has to have within themselves yeah. in order to be able to, you know, go against, you know, an, an adversarial situation. Yeah. Where, where does that come from for but you? I, I, for me, you know, and I think this is really true across the board. Someone told me that I had the capacity 
to be brilliant and to be successful. Mm. And that happened, and, and, it, and she wrote it in my yearbook, in my graduating yearbook from Garfield. And she was a, a, a teacher. She was not in the school system, but she was a teacher. And she was someone that I worked with. And I read that, and I went, oh, wow, somebody thinks that I can do well. And I had not heard that specifically in that way. And I kept hearing it. You know what I mean? After I started doing whatever, you know, whether it was radio or television mm -hmm. or whatever it was, when people said to me, you're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I am? Okay. Well, let me get better. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that. I think it's really um, instilling this concept and this ideal into the body of individuals mm -hmm. that they can then build from. It's like pouring, you know, a little bit in and leaving space for more to be poured in. Mm -hmm. And I think people, I mean, look at you. We've poured, we've poured into <laughs> you and you are overflowing. <laughs> But wouldn't you Thank agree you. that it's it's mm. um, a lot to do with yeah. encouragement? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot to do with that. You know, I, I will also come back and, you know, one caveat to kind of that early life story. I was a parent at 16. I graduated mm. high school as a mother. Mm. And I was told that I would never be anything and that I had ruined my life. Mm. And those things sat in my spirit, and they probably still sit there, to prove that that's not true, mm. you know? So that's adversity in some ways, but it was an opportunity. Mm. And um, everything I do, have done, is to be there for my kids, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. So let's go back to that 16-year-old who just graduated with a baby. You meet that young lady today. What do you say? Well done, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Go go ahead and keep going, you know? Mm -hmm. There was a... There was... There was humiliation in that, mm -hmm. and literally people that I th thought, well, they did think highly of me. Um, and I, that was just their way of saying to me that I had disappointed them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Were you disappointed in yourself in that moment? No. Or did you believe I really you wasn't. Were, did you believe you were going to be all right? There, there was, I mean, there were always these times where I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. But um, I moved away from home at 17. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I got to take control over this situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. I just took control. And, you know, it wasn't all roses. And we suffered through Mm -hmm. But um, it wasn't insurmountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, you know, yes, you, mm -hmm. can, you can make something of your life. Mm. One last question for you. You have a long-standing reputation of being an amazing leader, a champion for various communities here in Seattle and, and, and just nationwide. Um, you are the mother to so many, you are the mm -hmm. sister to even more, mm -hmm. and you are the friend to countless people. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, simple, that I made something better. Mm. That's it. That's it. Mm. Whatever that might be, if I made it better, I don't want to make things worse. <laughs> What? What do you I mean? mean? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think that's, you know, kind of the basis. I don't want to make things worse. Yeah. I want to make things better. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, with art noir, it's like, this is a way of reinstilling, reclaiming some of what we as a black community lost. Mm. And so if I can do something to make it better, I'll do it. I, that's it. I just want to make some make things better. Mm-hmm. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so inspired and touched. I was like tearing up at oh, some points. Like, I know. I know. Mm. We didn't talk about the arts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we have to have you back on. But I, I, you know, I think it's important. We can, of course, talk about policy and we can talk yeah. about all sorts of things. But I feel like I'm even more closer to you. Mm. And I feel like those who will watch this will as well. Because you just told the story of so many people whose voices... Yeah. are muted. Yeah. Thank you for unmuting oh, their voices. Thank you. Thank you. My absolute honor. Truly beautiful. Thank you. Living legacy right <laughs> here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this amazing, inspiring video with Vivian Phelps. I'm Dr. Quentin Morris here at Unmute the Voices. Enjoy your day. Yeah.